Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Send out your light and your truth, that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. In our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, let us adore him. invite you to join me in saying a portion of Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone and his compassion is over all his works. 
The Lord upholds all those who fall. He lifts up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand and satisfy the needs of every living creature. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving in all his works. The Lord is near to those who call upon him, to all those who call upon him faithfully. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and helps them. The Lord preserves all those who love him, but he destroys all the wicked. My mouth shall speak the praises of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel for he has glorified you. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. And Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. The word of the Lord. Be God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The problem with miracle stories, and it's chronic, is that the miracles overwhelm just about everything else in the stories. We tend to fixate, either with astonishment or skepticism, on what we take to be examples of divine intervention. The usual course of events is interrupted. The unbudging limits of our physical reality are breached. And God pops in to make our circumstances at least a little better at least for the moment. This has been one of the chief inducements for faith. Wouldn't we all like the advantage of having access to this kind of power? When trouble comes, if you have faith enough, God will step in. This confidence has become the unfortunate face of American Christianity both for its fervent believers and for its ardent detractors. It's all about miracles. And yet this trust is not true to what the scriptures themselves attest. Miracles are not the point of any of the stories where they occur. And God is not to be reduced thereby to a somewhat fickle ally who can be cajoled or charmed to the point of acting exceptionally. The story of Jonah isn't about the whale, and the story of Daniel isn't about his surviving the lion's den, and the feeding of the 5,000 isn't about the loaves and the fishes. Nor is it simply a moral tale about world hunger, or our responsibility to find a way to resolve the issue of adequate food distribution. Even Jesus seemed to concede that tomorrow will always be another day, and everyone will then move on. Once again, as per usual, the people will disperse. But then we don't ponder this continuance of the mundane. We're always stuck flailing about the mirror. In its context, however, the story as Matthew recorded it is actually about the crowds. And this is strikingly relevant to our time too, for we seem unable to discern now whether the crowds in our own streets are a reason for hope or a menace to public order. Or they should be appreciated as a mark of the health of our democracy 
or forcefully and violently suppressed as a danger to it. Crowds seem to be a living, writhing Rorschach blot onto which we assign intentions that are aligned with our own perspectives. Which can lead us to ask then, what did Jesus see when the crowds clamored after him and chased him down? This was, after all, the last thing that Jesus wanted. He had set out by boat with the sole purpose of being alone. John the Baptist had just been murdered in an act of monstrous stupidity. And in response, Jesus simply needed space away from people, away from all of them. A desolate terrain was most welcomed. But the crowds didn't allow him this. They were relentless. What was it then that made him respond to them with compassion? Who did he seek? This is the turning point of the story. It's crux. Why did he stay there? Why did he not go elsewhere? We are not told. But that silence speaks volumes. If the crowd represented the downtrodden masses, the text does not say. If they were suffering under the oppression of Roman occupation, they did not protest. If they were not allowed to assemble as they wished or worship as they thought that it was commanded of them, Matthew does not give us this insight. If they were the forgotten underclass, demeaned as the rabble, this is not mentioned. And in turn, Jesus didn't use the opportunity, as is so often attributed to him, to begin a movement. He didn't preach. There were no calls for an insurrection. Jesus didn't cite issues or try to organize an opposition. He didn't advocate for change. He didn't seek advantage by playing off the people's anger or their resentment or their sense of despair. He didn't announce a new order or distribute a plan for a more equitable social structure. Nor did he say that he possessed the keys to a kingdom that would give them respite from all of the struggles of the world. We're told nothing. He could have orchestrated a coronation. The crowds had rushed to him. But then he had just seen the evils that come so easily within a monarchy. Salome danced, and John was executed. Quick as that. And maybe the crowd didn't want a king either. Maybe they too didn't just want to win, and saw in Jesus something other. Something that might provide a different fulfillment. Matthew mentioned only that he healed their sick. It was his disciples then that finally near the close of the day voiced their exhaustion. Not from the work of any of their tasks, but merely from the weight of having the crowd pressed upon them. And they would have had them sent away just for food and not at all with cruel intentions. But Jesus extended his compassion one step further. They should eat together, he said. So they did. He made provision for their staying. 
I have trouble imagining that anyone actually took count of how many were there. The count wasn't meant to be a calculation of how much food would be needed, nor was it a useful data point that could be exaggerated to make the miracle even more miraculous. Compassion isn't limited by measures of quantification. Were there 5,000? Or 4,090? Or 500? It didn't matter then. It doesn't now. The number was merely an indication of the array of human need present before Jesus. We all fit into that crowd. That's the meaning of the number. And just so, was it really just two fish and five loaves? Are we supposed to be impressed or incredulous by the claim that these could feed so many? Here, too, the number is of no importance, except as a marker of how very little is required for compassion to be expressed. As little as whatever happens to be there. And none of us, in this regard, have so little that we cannot extend significant grace to whomever stands before us. First, by choosing not to leave. And second, not to dismiss them. Miracles don't transform anything. They announce something dramatic. Compassion transforms. For it's an action that endures not only beyond the moment, but sometimes well beyond the time of one's own life. In a short address published the day of his own funeral this week, Congressman John Lewis chose to mark the end of his life with words of inspiration and hope for all who will come after him. I don't say this lightly. I can't. His words have more power than mine perhaps ever will. His own arduous path burnished his words so that they shine with the truth hammered out of immense integrity and courage. I read them as only a humbled witness, as one who has been supremely gifted by him. In my life, he wrote, I have done all that I can to demonstrate the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now, he concluded, it is your turn to let freedom ring. Underlying the work of all of his struggles, John Lewis miraculously maintained an undying compassion. That same compassion is our chief work in faith. Bent then toward all that is right and good. For apart from compassion, what is right and what is good will never be realized.
please joining, join me in affirming the words of our faith as found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day, we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have the mercy on us. Lord, have the mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we shall never hope in vain. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. O God, give us strength to live another day. Let us not turn coward before its difficulties or prove recreant to its duties. Let us not lose faith in other people. Keep us sweet and sound of heart in spite of ingratitude, treachery, or meanness. Preserve us from minding little stings or giving them. Help us to keep our hearts clean and to live so honestly and fearlessly that no outward failure can dishearten us or take away the joy of conscious integrity. Open wide the eyes of our souls that we may see good in all things. Grant us this day some new vision of your truth. Inspire us with the spirit of joy and gladness and make us the cup of strength to suffering souls in the name of the strong deliverer, our only Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O God, who created all peoples in your image, we thank you for the wonderful diversity of races and cultures in this world. Enrich our lives by ever widening circles of fellowship and show us your presence in those who differ most from us until our knowledge of your love is made perfect in our love for all your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We give thanks for the wedding of Tommy Garrity and Sophie Novak. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We remember especially Jimmy, Leela, Pam, Linnea, Gary, 
Joan, John, Yvonne, Peter, Riley, Taggart, Jason, Dana, Stephanie, and Rebecca. And we commend to your mercy Rose Atherton, for whom memorial flowers are given. Together we now pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, we your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.